Void eye injury. Do not modify darts or dart blaster. Do not modify darts or dart blaster. What the? Do not modify darts or dart blaster. Everyone, every single one. Do not modify darts or dart blaster. Huh. I think Hasbro might have a problem with me. It seems like every Nerf Blaster that I truly love that I have in my collection has undergone like some tremendous amounts of modification, whether that be new springs, new plunger tubes, new wiring, new switches, higher, higher uh, RPM motors, whatever it is, they've all been changed and they've been brought up to a, a new level. Taking something that inaccurately shoots at 50 feet and then doing some modification to it to make it shoot super pinpoint accurate at 150 feet is something I really like. I mean, I think that's a really cool thing to do. And I do believe there's a lot of people out in the hobby today that share this passion with me. But it has to be said, Hasbro probably does not think the same way we do. In fact, I would say that Hasbro probably frowns on this. Now, one way I have been able to do all these modifications on my blasters is through 3D printing. Now, with these printers, I do anything from little individual parts and upgrades for existing Nerf blasters to fully printing entire blasters. So in today's video, we're gonna explore the concept of 3D printing in the foam tagging community. So the thing that I know Hasbro and other toy companies don't want you to know about is how much 3D printing has grown in the last few years. Not only are designers making beautiful, flawless sculpts, but with SLA printing, you can actually make super fine detailed stuff for maybe even like a tabletop game or just very ornate pieces that you typically don't associate with 3D printing. So real quick, let me give a rundown as to the two different types of printing. Number one, is FDM. This is what we're most familiar with in the Nerf space. So FDM, or also known as Fused Deposition Modeling, or Triple F, which I like to refer to it as, is basically fused filament fabrication, essentially is done by melting layers of plastic, and they, they stick together, but it's very small, and it can create, over a long period of time, it can create very beautiful, complex shapes and things that you don't get from traditional manufacturing, which is really cool to have at your fingertips at home. The second type is known as SLA, or Stereolithography Resin Printing. That's a mouthful. And essentially, this is done by printing in a vat of resin. And if anyone knows about basic resin, it is curable with UV light. So what happens is each layer is being cured by UV light as it shoots each layer, and then it moves up. So usually you'll see this type of printing pulling out of a vat of resin and then curing. Now in the Nerf hobby, SLA printing is gonna be primarily used for possibly flywheels, but really for scar barrels. And what scar barrels are is a rifled barrel that causes the dart to spin, which helps increase accuracy. And the reason why SLA printing is great for that is because the fine level of detail needed in the actual barrel material because uh, FDM printing actually adds lines and you don't want lines when you're working with a rifled barrel that's spinning a dart. So in the end, SLA yields super high detailed resin prints and are more suited for high detailed models and ornate you know, stuff like trinkets and tabletop gaming and that kind of stuff. So what is the big dirty secret that Hasbro doesn't want you to know about? Well, when you start looking at some of these higher, higher end offerings from Hasbro and Nerf, you'll see that you can start to spend a lot of money on these blasters. You know, when you have something like a, a Perseus or a Prometheus or even a Hyper, the large Hyper Mach 100, or just these very large blasters, even a Titan, like the huge Titan, these things are hundreds of dollars, over $100 easy sometimes. So when you start looking at price points like that, it starts to make you realize, well, I could be spending this money on other things, like possibly buying a 3D printer and paying, you know, 20, 30 bucks for some filament and printing out these really amazing blaster designs made by the community. When you start to look at it in that regard, building a blaster yourself with your own 3D printer can become very affordable in 2021. Not only is it affordable, but it's also very rewarding and just a lot of fun. Imagine being a dad and having a kid come up to you and say, hey, you know, for my birthday, I want, I want a really cool, powerful Nerf, Nerf blaster. If you go and buy one off the shelf, chances are they're not gonna be great. In fact, they're gonna be straight up a waste of money in some, in some regards. 
especially something from like a Roblox line, a lot of the stuff from Fortnite, like there's just a lot of garbage out there and they're not even affordable. Some of them are like, you know, pushing up to a hundred dollars. So, you know, 50 to a hundred dollars on a toy that's, you know, probably, probably gonna break and isn't gonna be super accurate, isn't gonna have high performance. And so if you have the ability to 3D print and build your own blaster and give it as a gift, I think that is speaks volumes and it's gonna be not just another toy that's thrown in a toy box, but instead this is gonna be a, a cherished gift that potentially will last a long time. And even if it does break, you have the capability of printing your own parts and doing work on it. And something that I am a big fan of is it starts to basically make young people ask question about, you know, what is robotics? What is science? You know, how did you make that? What is a 3D printer? How does that operate? I want to see, I want to learn. Oh, they, you can design your own stuff. They start getting into design. They start getting into programming. I'm a big advocate of STEM and I think it's great for young minds to, to be occupied with this type of learning. So this is just something that steps right into that. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it and I highly encourage it. Here is a great example of what I'm talking about. This is a custom Griffin. This print was pretty easy to do and it only took about $15 worth of filament, which is hardly nothing. Electronics were about $40 or so. This does have some uh, special flywheels and motors in them to make them a little bit spicier than normal. But if you went with the entry level, you could probably get all the electronics for this blaster for only like 20 bucks. That's wires, switches, motors, even the wheels are probably going to be the most expensive part. Some wheels go up to about $20 for just the wheels. So all in all, a cheap build of this blaster right here, you could probably get it around $50 to $60. Now that might seem like a lot, but once you're set up to build these, having a $60 fully customized Nerf blaster versus, you know, like an Ultra One that you grabbed off the shelf at Walmart, it's not going to be the same thing at all. This right here is can be used in a competitive scene. This is an actual like high performance Nerf blaster where something like the Ultra One or just kind of just a big cash grab pile of junk. The darts that come with the Ultra One are just super unreliable and inaccurate. And I don't know, it's just, it's literally night and day between this and something like that. Now I use the Ultra One as an example because when comparing this tagger versus that tagger, you're gonna be way more impressed with this. And that 60 bucks or 50 bucks that you spent on your Ultra One, it's probably not gonna bring you as much excitement. So after getting this thing fully printed out and painted it, now keep in mind you don't need to paint your blasters. There is actually some beautiful filaments out there right now. There's like really cool iridescent ones and translucent ones and glow in the dark ones. There is just anything you could fathom, there's probably a filament for it. If you wanted to print this thing in bronze, and actually buff it out so it's like a shiny bronze, you can do that. I mean, it, the possibilities are endless with 3D printing. Now, if you wanted to print this and this back stock in wood, you wanted an actual kind of like a wood look to it, you can do that. You can also varnish them and stain them just like normal wood. So there's just a ton of stuff you can do. So the customization options for 3D printed custom blasters are just through the roof. You'll never see Hasbro offer something like that. It's just, they can't even compete. And I have even touched on hydro dipping. Hydro dipping is when you can basically put a wrap and dip your blaster and make whatever you want. When it comes to Nerf community, the custom blasters are just through the roof and truly amazing to see. So this blaster right here is just my go-to blaster. I have run this in several wars already and I'm just a big fan of it. This thing is battle tested and I can say without a shadow of a doubt, any Nerf War, this will absolutely decimate and destroy any stock Nerf Blaster out there. Now the reason why Hasbro, I believe, doesn't want you to know about 3D printing is just the sheer volume of stuff being designed and developed right now in the community. The internet is being absolutely flooded with designs. I'm gonna show a few here, and these are not even the tip of the iceberg. There's got to be thousands upon thousands of different designs going on right now where people are just designing to their heart's desire and they are just making really cool stuff. I do, I have noticed that you see a, a lot of reoccurring themes here. There's a, there's a lot of pistols out there. Uh, that's kind of what's being developed a lot of right now, but there's also some really cool stuff that's just 
really unique, really amazing. And I believe that as far as Nerf blasters are concerned, as far as how designs look and everything, Hasbro's really, uh, they're really behind the curve right now. Now, obviously they can afford to do this because they are a multi giant conglomerate of businesses and have tons of value in their shares. So this is just kind of whatever to them. But if you look at this as a standpoint of what Nerf looks like as a hobby, as a whole, Hasbro's really behind. They are, they are actually uh, years behind as to what's happening right now. Another thing we're pointing out is I know that Hasbro engineers are paid very handsomely for designing and developing the technology you see in Nerf Blasters. Whereas something on Etsy, like a small creator, they can basically put in all this time and energy and develop an STL file. These are the files that you print on the 3D printer and they'll sell the files for like five, 10 bucks, maybe 20. I've seen them go up to about 35. But uh, that's a very small fee for the amount of schooling and education and time and resource and R&D that goes into designing and developing, that is a very small fee. Let's just put it this way. If Hasbro were to sell a design, a fully 3D printable design of their blasters, I guarantee you'd be paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for that R&D. So it makes you wonder, how does a company compete with that? Obviously right now they're doing fine, but what does this look like in 10, 20, even 30 years? What happens when people have the ability to just manufacture whatever they want in their house? Because this is the beginning of 3D printing and the, uh, the technology. Imagine when you basically go to your phone and instead of buying something off of Amazon, you hit order and you hear behind you as your printer machine, your Amazon machine starts to replicate and build an item behind you and then you just go over and grab it. That might be our future. Now with all that out of the way, I would be doing a disservice to you if I didn't list out the negatives for 3D printing. And there are a few, there's a few big ones. So first off, number one, getting into the 3D printing hobby is in fact a hobby and there is a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of stuff you have to learn. I mean, it's not just grab a printer, start printing, you know, and, and then you have 3D printed Nerf blasters. There's, there's a little bit of learning involved there, even with the really high dollar, um, kind of plug and play solutions out there, they still require some level of, you know, education or, you know, self-taught stuff. There's a lot of videos. There's a lot of data out there that you just have to kind of get familiar with when doing 3D printing. Now, a lot of this is kind of ironic because like people will look at the price point of a cheap, you know, 3D printer, which some are like 150 bucks. Uh, so they'll be like, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna save some money and get that $150 printer. And then before they know it, you know, they're having to replace parts, they're having to spend countless hours on learning how to basically get that $150 printer up into a standard of quality that we're all used to. So in the end, you know, when you went for the lower cost printer, you could have just went with the $700 one or the more expensive printer and got all the features and basically made quality of life a little better. So now to be fair, I don't wanna discourage people buying the print, the cheaper printer because if you're looking to actually learn and basically become, make this a hobby, then yeah, it's fine to get the cheaper printer. Just make sure you understand there's gonna be a lot of uh, trial and error and maybe some of these other third party or kind of cheap you know, Chinese type of knockoff printers, they're not gonna have the supporting documentation that you need and it's gonna be a lot of learning. There's, it's a steep learning curve essentially. So that's the first area. Keep in mind, it is just a full on hobby in itself. So number two is the area that I keep trying to let people, you know, keep reminding people about and that is 3D printing is essentially a prototyping tool. What this means is the 3D printed parts are not gonna be at the same level as an injection molded part. Overall, the cost of the part, the thermal resistance of the part, and just overall the durability of it is not gonna be on par with a traditional injection molded. Now, to be fair, there are cheap injection molded parts, you know, cheap plastic, and then there's high levels, so. I'm just kind of talking at in general as a whole, injection molded parts are gonna be a lot better. And the final area I wanna talk about is just the overall issues with 3D printed parts. Now in the hobby in particular, we see a lot of stuff printed in PLA. PLA is a type of filament, a type of plastic that has a low melting point. In all, all things considered, it is a lower melting point. And because of that, in hot areas such as, you know, summer days in a car or even laying on a hot porch or whatever, wherever it is, 
these parts can warp and potentially even melt. So that's a big concern. So a lot of people say, okay, well, we'll go ahead and switch over to ABS or PETG. Uh, one issue I continuously find with PETG parts is if you use a high, if you use a PETG part on a high impact area, they are prone to shattering. So PETG is a little bit more brittle. PLA, not so brittle, but has lower melting point. PETG, high melting point, but can be brittle as certain, like maybe as a catch mechanism or a trigger assembly. Some of these high stress components, they do have a, a, a higher chance to shatter. Another issue of 3D printed parts is when printers are not dialed in, you can have issues with layer adhesion, and that is the ability for the layers to, to hold on to themselves so they can separate, so you have parts that snap in half. And also another issue is under extrusion, which is kind of similar and can lead to layer adhesion issues, but it's kind of its own issue on itself, and that is just the flow of plastic is not steady and you basically have you know, very, very bad structural integrity issues with your print. So that's, that's an issue. And this goes back to all the, all the training and all the studying and all the air testing and all that stuff you would have to do when diving into 3D printing. You have to get your printers dialed in. And the final area to talk about is people who don't have 3D printers that are looking to purchase parts, looking to purchase blasters that are pre-built. This is an issue in itself because the amount of time and energy it goes into 3D printing a blaster and putting it together drives the cost up a little bit too high. Uh, much of this video that I'm trying to explain to you is uh, grabbing a printer, making your own blaster is cheaper, but having someone else do it for you will possibly be a lot more expensive than, you know, some of the offerings from, you know, a company like Hasbro or Dart Zone or X-Shot. They're obviously going to have a much lower price point for blasters. And so leading into that is uh, finding replacement parts for your 3D printed blaster can be very frustrating and in the end if you don't have a printer it can be extremely expensive so if you ever buy a blaster make sure to check with the policy on what happens if your parts break do they have a, a policy set in place where they'll send you new parts or do you just have to buy a new blaster that's something worth looking at so in conclusion i for one want to see more people doing 3D printing, doing blaster design, building their own blasters. I think it's a great hobby, it's a great community, and I just love seeing the, the new innovative blasters and new designs, and I highly encourage people to do it. So that's where I stand. If you have any questions of the topics I've covered today, head on down to the comment section, leave a, leave a question, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. I'm Dr. Flux, I wanna thank you for watching today's video, and as always, Happy foam flinging.